uh, welcome everybody for me too. I just wanna say I'm absolutely delighted to be able to share this talk. I'm really looking forward to both the talk and the conversation afterwards. You will have been circulated uh, Professor Ellison Young's bio and talk. And I just wanted to highlight a few things around that is that she comes to us from the University of Melbourne where she is the Francine V. McNiff Professor of Criminology. And I think all of you are here because you're probably strongly aware of Alison's work, but she has written many, many papers and books. And for me, if we're just gonna go through our, our personal, personal hits is her book, Imagining Crime was a personal inspiration, which I think not only was groundbreaking for our field and other fields in, in and particularly in developing a cultural and critical criminology, but was personally inspirational and I think, has changed the thinking, not just of myself, but many people. And she continues to conduct groundbreaking work, which is plowing new ground in urban studies in cultural theory, um, let alone the impact she's had on her own subdiscipline of criminology. Um, she's speaking today on a current funded project by the Australian Research Council that is exploring spatial justice, public homelessness, and public dissent. The title of her talk is Atmospheres of Lockdown, Pandemic Criminality and Spatial Justice. Really pleased to be inviting such an eminent person who also is a native daughter of Paisley. Welcome back, Alison. And um, I will just turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Ali, for inviting me. And thanks for all your patience as we scheduled and rescheduled and tried to find dates that would work for this talk. It's been, it's great to finally be here. And I wish I could be with you all in Glasgow. Like I'm from just down the road. Uh, Melbourne feels a long way, in, way away, but um, as my family were noticing tonight, just even the idea of talking to people in Glasgow made my accent come back a bit stronger. So thank you for that. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the uh, lands of the Woiwurrung people in the Wurundjeri Nation in Victoria. Um, I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that I'm on stolen land whose sovereignty was never ceded. I want to begin a few days ago. So I'm going to share my screen and, I, and talk through some images. And the story of this talk starts, as I said, just a few days ago. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is incredibly recent, current even, um, in terms of Melbourne. So late on Thursday, the 22nd of October in Melbourne, Twitter, was filled with the tweets of people who were unable to sleep. It was like New Year's Eve, people were waiting for midnight, they said. They were at home, but they were counting down the time to 11.59 p.m. At midnight, many went outside of their houses. One sat in the driveway of her car for several minutes and then drove up and down the nearby highway. Another went for a walk, talking to strangers in the street. In some neighbourhoods, bars opened at midnight and served drinks, and some restaurants opened for meals. A hairdresser cut people's hair. Normal, everyday activities, but taking place at a strange time of day, as though quotidian timetables had been knocked off their axes. What was happening? 11.59pm marked the end of Melbourne's sixth lockdown. And according to the state government, it's the end of the final lockdown that would ever be imposed as the state moves towards herd immunity and the endemicity of COVID-19 amid a population with high vaccination rates. The total accumulated duration of days under lockdown orders in Melbourne varied according to which degree of restriction was being counted. So the total that we've been in lockdown might be 277 days, might be 257 or it might be 263. According to some people, Melbourne has had the longest lockdown in the world. That's a claim that's probably not correct, but nonetheless, it works to cause some emotional distress to those of us living in, in Melbourne. But on Thursday, the 22nd of October, Melbourne had been in lockdown for a long, long time, and its end was being celebrated by many as if it were New Year's Eve, wearily watching the clock countdown on social media, 
or engaging in a kind of jubilant exercise of liberties that had been withdrawn from them. But more than that, it was something that people simply wanted to witness. One Twitter user said of the end of lockdown, I just want to feel it, smell it, taste it, see it and hear it. So in this talk, I want to consider lockdown as a lawscape and as an atmosphere, both of which have spatial, sensory and affective dimensions. And I'm also going to consider lockdown as a constitutive element in the emergence of what I'm calling pandemic criminality or pandemic deviance. And I'm going to be drawing attention to the ways in which in Melbourne lockdown took place unevenly and had socially and spatially unequal effects exacerbating extant vulnerabilities. So what is a lockdown? We've all been living in it but bear with me while I think through what it is. At its most fundamental level it constrains movement and activity within the everyday lives and spaces of citizens. Lockdowns have, grad have gradations often known as stages, each of which entails a particular level of constraint or control. In Melbourne since March 2020 there have been variously mandated 24 hours home confinement, curfews, a ring of steel around the city and police checkpoints, resulting in what Judith Butler has called the subjugation arising from the coercive exposure of bodies at checkpoints and other sites of intensified surveillance. The pandemic city has its own network of legal regulation, what Andreas Philippopoulos Mihalopoulos has called a lawscape. In the pandemic city, the lawscape includes a suite of behavioural rules with a parallel set of administrative offences representing their infringement. And these are derived from emergency powers backed up with a mobilised and expanded police force. Some states, such as New South Wales, have created new criminal offences such as one related, relating to coughing or spitting on essential workers. These administrative offences and criminal offences come with a suite of penalties designed for deterrence. In Victoria, a $200 penalty for not wearing a mask, between $1,800 and $4,500 for taking part in or organising a prohibited gathering, for businesses up to $10,000 for operating outside of the permitted takeaway only rules. Since the start of the pandemic, about 38,000 fines have been issued in Victoria, but only 25% of them have been paid, raising the question of whether they'll ever be paid or ever enforced. Victoria at the moment is um, currently proposing enhanced criminal offences arising from lockdown. This is happening right now. Um, yesterday, the uh, Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment brackets pandemic management bill passed the lower house. So it has a, a second reading to go. Um, it creates many, many um, special and enhanced powers for the premier and for the health minister, but notably also creates a new offence, intentionally and recklessly breaching a public health order. And people convicted of this charge can be sentenced for up to two years imprisonment or receive a $90,000 fine. Businesses operating outside public health rules can be fined up to $455,000, half a million dollars. Within a city, as Ed Soja points out, the geographies in which we live can have both positive and negative effects on our lives. Thinking through spatial justice in a pandemic city means that these geographies are filled with material and imagined forces that affect events and experiences, forces that can hurt us or help us in nearly everything that we do individually or collectively. So in this talk I'm trying to bear what Soja says in mind and also consider what Andreas Philippopoulos Mihalopoulos calls corporeal emplacement in order to think about the criminality and deviance that's highlighted by the pandemic and to locate the crime scenes in which they occur. Now, when trying to make sense of the lockdown city, we must keep in mind that lockdown intensifies the microbiopolitics of a city. Public health directives under emergency powers foster for inhabitants a normative awareness of everyday self-obligations, 
and a sense of entitlement to judge others. As Michelle Brown has said, the cop in your head is always present. Lockdown regimes thus require observation of a repertoire of lawful conduct, as well as engendering many ways in which public health rules can be infringed. So if I adapt comments by Stuart Eldon about place, I would say that lockdown strategies disrupt the affective volume of a city. They thicken its regulatory tactics and they thin its networks of connection. So in place of conventional social communicative interactions, the everyday atmospheres of the city communicate with the subject through myriad sensory differentials. So to make sense of the lockdown city, perhaps the answer is found in the senses. As McClanahan and South propose, borrowing from Kant, there is ample evidence suggesting recognition of the importance of the totality of the senses as the essential site of knowledge production. As they say, as Kant says, all knowledge begins with the senses. So these relations of connection between place and sense play a crucial role in the generation of meaning and value including in the construction of atmosphere, what Ali Fraser and Dan Matthews define as a spatialized feeling. So I'm interested in what are the spatialized affects of lockdown. And to that end, ever since March 2020, I've been conducting a sensory ethnography of Melbourne's various lockdowns, walking, photographing, taking notes, following social media. And I also want to note that some of the ideas in this paper were shaped by research conducted for a different project on spatial justice, homelessness and political dissent, together with my research assistant, um, who's here in the audience, Christian Popovsky. Hello, Christian. So let's think now about the senses of lockdown. Let's start with sight. Newspapers throughout the start of the pandemic published photographs of New York, Paris, London, Melbourne, Sydney and many more, showing us the strange spectacle of cities without their crowds. The idea of the empty city was a powerful trope. It had a powerful effect on the spectator looking at a scene such as this. For most commentators, the absence of individuals in public space didn't connote public health but was read as an after image of devastation, as though some catastrophe had occurred, some kind of 28 days later scenario that we were looking at, waiting for the zombie apocalypse to be made apparent. Touch. Lockdowns were implemented within a context in which touch was problematized early on. We quickly entered what Bratton has called a state of touchlessness. From late February, we were encouraged to avoid shaking hands, to use elbow bumps and toe touches as substitutes. And these were later super, um, superseded by air fives, gesturing at each other from a, across the prescribed social distance. Contact with surfaces was discouraged and then singled out as a potential method of infection. Signs in Melbourne on pedestrian crossing poles proclaimed that the signals are automated to stop people touching the buttons and new cleaning crews were employed by the state government in lockdown one um, and walked from intersection to intersection, wiping surfaces as they go. I just want to note before I move on that um, Bratton, who makes a point about touchlessness, is actually following Jean-Luc Nancy's arguments that physical touch is not in itself immediate, lacking mediation. Physical touch has more visceral tactility than remote contact, but mediated contact can be thought of as touching at a distance. Good to remember this when we're Zooming with friends and family, so it's not as remote as we might imagine, but it's also relevant to explain why it is things like Zoom bombing or text scamming feel so invasive and distressing to people during lockdown. And it's also why lawyers in Melbourne who had to move online in order to conduct interviews with clients and court processes, why they took their family photographs down in case clients could see them in the background. The remoteness of 
um, no physical touch didn't mean that they felt immune from uh, the connection that those food types might engender. Taste. Lockdown generated anxiety about taste by reference to privation and absence. Supermarket aisles periodically emptied of various goods, most notoriously toilet paper, but also at various times during our various lockdowns, pasta, potatoes, tin tomatoes, chicken, apples, lettuce. Bok choy sat unwanted in supermarkets when all other green vegetables had disappeared. Now, smell. Louisa Allen in New Zealand has been conducting smell walks to answer the question that she poses, what does lockdown smell like? Following the sensory urbanist methods of walking around and no noting what she could smell in the air. And certainly the pandemic has its odours. Some are idiopathic to the crisis, others are familiar ones reworked into new species and times. The scent of hand sanitizer fills the air around cafes and shops that are still open. Individuals using public transport carried little bottles of it dangling from backpacks and intermittently the air in any space might fill with a scent that mixes antiseptic chemicals with an overlay of lemon or eucalyptus. When cafes and restaurants could remain only open for takeaway, anyone walking through the city streets might encounter the aroma of cooking seeping out from a shuttered cafe as it prepared uh, meals for Uber Eats delivery. Smell travels through air, as do the invisible droplets of coronavirus infection, although the virus itself is unscented. Infectious disease experts calculated where to stand such that droplets would not travel through the air to be breathed in by another. In Melbourne, joggers and cyclists were exempt from the wearing of masks, and many took up running in order to retain the possibility of breathing unmasked air. Others walking masked through the city streets grumbled about breathing the unimpeded panting breaths of sweaty joggers as they pounded past them. For all its apparent ethereality, air is a profoundly contested terrain, as Peter Aidy points out. Sound. For many, lockdown cities sound quieter, less sound than before. In New York, recordings made one year apart show a drop of five decibels during the pandemic, a massive difference equivalent to the difference between rush hour and 2 a.m. quiet. Some reported that the reduction of industrial noise made them more aware of smaller sounds such as birdsong. Other sounds just are still the same, but sound but different. Uh, Claire Colley comments on how trams in Melbourne sounded different. They rattled more because there were almost no passengers on them to weight them down on the tram tracks. Other sounds were added to the urban soundscape. In Italian towns, people singing from their balconies in cities like London, many other UK cities, people were clapping or banging pots for healthcare workers. In Melbourne, more gothically, um, Friday 8pm screaming sessions were organised during lockdown two last year. People would stand on their doorstep and scream into the winter darkness. Researchers such as Pete Stollery have attempted to map the COVID soundscape to drill down into specific sounds within it the bird song, the clapping, transport noises. In that soundscape here in Melbourne, helicopters became a constant component of the sound here. Helicopters droned overhead in certain areas, enforcing curfew or monitoring breaches of public health orders, also later filming protesters. So as Roland, Atk Roland, Atk Roland Atkinson says, the city's sonic ecology was disrupted by lockdown. So within these altered sensory landscapes, where are its crime scenes and what constitutes pandemic criminality or deviance? I'm going to talk about three of these crime scenes. The first is the street. Outside of the sorry, outside of the home, individuals encountered a range of spatial interventions that regulate movement and conduct. 
on the pavement outside shops, the X's taped to show where um, customers should stand, pedestrians taking ostentatiously large steps around each other on the pavement, temperature checks at shop entrances, QR codes being scanned for contact tracing and to prove vaccination status, lack of masks resulting in a fine, picnic numbers being regulated and subject to fines. So the street, the scene of this new sort of kind of risk and sociality also became the locus for anti-lockdown protests in which first of all hundreds and then later thousands turned up to protest in order to contest the public health restrictions, the vaccine mandate and other aspects of governmental response. Protests often took place on weekends, but from August onwards, their frequency accelerated, culminating in a period in which protests occurred every day for over a week. Police shut down public transport in and out of the CBD. They utilised kettling of protesters. They created an exclusion zone in the air by prohibiting media helicopters from flying over places likely to be the scene of protest, and they deployed highly militarized containment tactics, including the use of tear gas, rubber bullets, gas propelled capsicum spray, helicopter surveillance, and the deployment of a new Bearcat tactical response vehicle purchased for use in terrorist incidents. In these protests, the crowd of protesters embody the possibility of what Ilan Wall calls a liminal moment when the political order finally collapses. The order doesn't collapse, but the crowd appears to embody the possibility that it might. And although dozens were arrested and on the spot fines were issued and those named as organizers were charged with offenses such as affray and conspiracy, as Jodie Dean puts it, the assembling of a crowd opens up the possibility of the people as an oppositional and ruptural force. So focusing on criminal charges against individuals misses the point, which is, which is that assembly took place and will take place and could take place again and again. So the second crime scene that I want to talk about is the home. And in um, the lockdown strategy in Victoria condensed into a single spatially specific slogan, stay home. But the home has never been a space free of risk. It's, it resulted in a situation of people working at homes, homeschooling, staying at home, in what people started describing as a soft incarceration. But it was softer for some than for others, and with containment more pleasurable for those whose um, Lockdown was facilitated by the hidden infrastructure of online delivery workers, food delivery services. Um, for the middle class, when you ran out of shampoo, you simply ordered it online and it turned up at the door. There was very little investigation into the invisible population who was um, continuing to drive this service infrastructure that made the soft incarceration so soft. So actually, refuse now to use the term soft incarceration for lockdown. I think it's better to talk about the home as being converted into a container space, but to um, allow incarceration to have its properly carceral meaning for those that I'll come on to talk about shortly. But for those living in a domestic setting characterised by fear or em emotional and physical abuse, being locked down at home put, puts lives in danger. And for these citizens, the home is entirely unhomely. At first, data in New South Wales and Victoria showed no increase in reports of incidents of violence within the home. Although the Australian Institute of Criminology conducted a self-report study which showed high rates of violence. As the end of 2020 approached, incidents um, had increased 12% in South Australia, 15% in Western Australia. And family violence incidents, i.e. like happenings that were logged officially as crimes, crimes of assault or homicide within a family setting, were found in June this year to have increased by 6%. But I would say reporting in lockdown is extremely risky. Many choose instead to call 
um, support organizations for advice instead of calling the police, because it's well known that to call the police is a huge risk factor for homicide in the home. And when you're living with your abuser with no um, space to do so without um, his presence, that risk is increased. So in Victoria, support workers estimated a 50% increase in the number of calls for assistance and advice during lockdown, a huge increase. Another domestic space is a different kind of crime took place, the structural harm of slow state authorized violence. For 3000 residents in nine public housing towers in Melbourne, a so-called hard lockdown was announced without prior warning on Saturday afternoon in July, 2020. State government ordered residents to be confined under police supervision, allowed to leave only for medical treatment. Housing estate was surrounded by police and residents, some of whom had limited English and had, who had migrated from conflict zones, found themselves in involuntary confinement, which Peter Marcuse has called one of the two cardinal forms of spatial injustice. State government didn't liaise with community leaders and the residents didn't receive translated information for several days. An exercise program wasn't implemented for several days and initially what was put in place involved having people congregate within areas cordoned off by temporary fencing and surrounded by police in a manner that evoked the exercise yard of a prison. During this period of hard lockdown, mass testing of residents resulted in 30 cases being discovered amongst the 3,000, a number that didn't seem to justify the oppressive strategy. The Victorian Ombudsman conducted a report into the lockdown of the towers and noted numerous inequities in the handling of the situation, including a marked failure to meet human rights obligations and the indifferent um, infliction of harm and distress, distress upon the residents. The third crime scene that I want to speak about is the hotel room. And what of individuals without housing? When a government enjoins its citizens to stay home, what happens to those experiencing homelessness? In the initial weeks of the crisis here, the likely impact on those without housing was of great concern to advocates and service providers. And the government initially created pop-up accommodation, but then decided it would use the motels and hotels that were empty due to the collapse of tourism to provide temporary accommodation. So this was extended again in July, 2020, again in February and again in July. So, um, People have been in hotel accommodation while homeless as a temporary measure for now about 18 months. And this program will endure until February next year. Today, the government announced a building program, program to provide housing to people who've been in this hotel accommodation. Um, 250 families will have accommodation built for them. That sounds terrific, um, but I just want to note that at the last census there were over 25,000 people in Victoria who were homeless and so this is um, a very minor intervention. Initially it seemed that the pandemic by prompting government to try to house the homeless might actually succeed in generating the political will and funding to meet needs for long-term stable housing but um, researchers who've been surveying um, the response to COVID amongst the homeless in New Zealand, in France, in Melbourne, in the UK and Canada show that government strategies were animated less by a desire to provide shelter than the will to regulate the movement of a population seemed to be risky. So housing people in hotels was thought to be a way of keeping an eye on their movements and reduce the risk of, of um, infection to the wider population. But in addition to using hotel rooms to accommodate the homeless, hotels have also been used for quarantine and detention. The conventional connotation by hotel, holiday making pleasure, has been upended by the use of now empty hotels for the mandatory quarantine of returning travellers. So last year, individuals flying into Australian cities from overseas were required to spend 14 days under supervision in quarantine hotels, such as 
such as Ridges in Carlton, as you can see here. A public inquiry in Victoria last year found that security guards deployed at so-called hot or red hotels, the name um, being used to denote hotels where COVID cases were detected. Guards in these hotels were not adequately trained in infection prevention and that a range of health procedures were bypassed in these hotels. Um, the lack of infection protocols in, in Ridges seeded the second wave in Victoria that led to a, um, a large number of deaths here. Commentators have also called for hotel quarantine to be recognised as custodial, with a range of human rights protections being put in place. And at the end of the public inquiry, the report recognised not just public um, practical measures such as access to fresh air and exercise, but also language in framing those within hotel quarantine. The inquiry said language such as resident rather than detainee should be used to reduce, reduce the risk of such language having a negative effect on the culture of the facility and to reflect that quarantine is a health measure and not a punitive measure. But some of the individuals staying in otherwise empty hotels are exactly that, detained persons. Dozens of evacuated refugees flown to Australia from detention camps in Papua New Guinea and Nauru as part of the now abandoned Medivac program have been housed in hotels for more than 18 months, unable to leave the buildings, often sharing rooms. So following Sarah Keenan's analysis, the federal government has created a border in an ordinary city street. Keenan talks of these sorts of borders as at once invisible and real, intermittent and permanent, a border that attempts to um, indiv individually subjugate a border internal to the nation that has already been entered. So as Claire Lochner notes, for these men, hotel detention has lasted vastly longer than the 14 days served by returning travellers. The men are in effective detention despite having been evacuated from detention. The benign intentions of the Medivac legislation have been opportunistically converted into what Joseph Pugliese calls civil penality. In Melbourne, the detainees are located in the Ridges Hotel, now called the Park Hotel, although as you can see, the, the hotel, the sign that used to say hotel has been covered with black tarpaulin. Whereas the hotel quarantine inquiry report emphasized the need for fresh air and exercise, refugees in hotel detention live without access to either of these, despite having been categorized as suffering from health conditions serious enough to merit evacuation on medical grounds. Protesters and refugee advocates hold vigils outside the hotels demanding the men's release and trying to offer encouragement to them simply through their regular presence outside the hotel where they would hold up signs with messages of support and wave to their confined occupants. During lockdown, it was not possible for people to maintain this kind of vigil. So there were rules about how about assembly, more than people from outside this, the one household couldn't assemble in public. Um, the, the vigils are resuming as of this week. For both returning travellers and detainees, the spaces occupied are the same hotel rooms with a bed, a sink, perhaps a bathroom, a desk and a chair, a window that looks out, a locked door that opens for the delivery of food. So a room in itself is no different when it's occupied by a pleasure-seeking tourist, um, but for the quarantined or detained, these same furnishings become part of the limitations and constraints imposed by the carceral context in which they now exist. The rooms, bed, chair and windows exist on the same spatial legal continuum for a holiday maker, return traveller and mid evacuated individual alike. But in hotel detention, every piece of furniture is imbued with the force of governmental authority, such that the space of the room and the law are isomorphous. In such rooms, these simple pieces of furniture become part of a space which Andreas Philippopoulos Mihalopoulos says, is brimming with ideological charge, aggression and confrontation. So in these intensified species of institutional violence, 
neither linguistic acknowledgement nor material amelioration is forthcoming. Having seeded the second wave of COVID cases last year, the hotel is once again the site of an outbreak, this time among the men held in it. 15 of the 45 detainees now have COVID. All are in hotel detention because they had medical conditions that rendered offshore detention a threat to their health. One is there because in detention, he had set himself on fire. Many are already traumatized. Some have serious mental and physical illness. Air circulates between the rooms thanks to inadequate ventilation systems. Last year, the windows of the Park Hotel were nailed shut. So during Melbourne's six lockdowns spread over approximately 260 or 270 days by ethnographic forays into the streets of the city, have approached lockdown as a generative event, one that created a new cityscape, offered a new phenomenology of the city, and a new or intensified array of crime scenes within it. Today, at 6 p.m., so a couple of hours ago here, we apparently reached the end of lockdown. But I want to argue that the end of lockdown doesn't mean that this generative event is concluded or that the lockdown city has disappeared. Instead, it haunts our movement through its streets and spaces, and we will for a long time be in lockdown, even as we are post lockdown, carrying its affects in our bodies and senses. But I also want to ask, has lockdown even ended? For all the celebratory meals, haircuts and tweets, lockdown continues in places such as the Park Hotel, former place of leisure and luxury, converted into a space of cruelty. So I want to conclude at this place of infection and detention, what Pugliese and Giannakopoulos would call a deathscape rendered invisible within the city. From here, although we're unable to see behind its screened windows and locked doors, we can name the crimes of the pandemic, the administrative offences committed by the maskless in supermarkets, the terrorising of family members by their abusers in the home, the militarised policing of protesters on the street, and the slow deaths from the cruelty of government indifference endured by refugees. If all knowledge begins with the senses, and if, as Bianchetti and all, it all right, the city of quarantine is a definitively unjust city, what would a spatially just post-lockdown city feel like? I would propose the following. First, that domestic space is part of the city and all discussions of the right to the city must include domestic space, not just the more conventional public space. In the pandemic city, heightened dependence on domestic space as a place of quarantine, refuge and workplace make this even more urgent. And second, domestic space takes myriad forms. It might be a house, an apartment, it might be a doorway, a car, a temporary shelter, a friend's living room, a sofa. All of these demand our understanding and recognition, even as we advocate for places that provide better shelter for all. And third, confinement in places of violence inflicts multi-layered harms upon citizens. Mitigation of such harm should be the primary task of governments, whether that's in hotel quarantine, hotel detention, family violence, lack of access to safe housing. And finally, we need to see and to respond to the strata of inequity and deprivation upon which our cities depend. Shift work, casual work, migration precarity, racial and gendered violence, and generational inequality of access to employment and education. What's at stake here? These steps are essential to ensure that the geographies of our everyday lives, as Soja puts it, at work, at home and moving through the city, can take place within, within a spatial legal continuum that is not one of what Andreas calls ideological charge, aggression and confrontation, but one in which we can find a spatial justice in the new crime scenes of the pandemic city. Thank you very much.